Mark is such a, a wonderful book. It outlines the life and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And last week we, we uh, saw how Jesus and his disciples sailed across the Sea of Galilee into the Gentile region of the Gerasenes. And in the first part of Mark chapter 5, we're told the story that there was a man on the other side of the shore who uh, was under the influence and had been possessed by a legion of demons that called themselves legion, for there are many of them. And we see how Jesus Christ addressed the circumstance and took authority over those spirits and cast them out of this man. Now, um, through the example that Jesus gave, he actively demonstrated that he, in fact, is Lord over the spirit world. There's no, no power in heaven, earth, or under the earth that is not subject to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can be thankful for that. But after Jesus performed this great miracle, and this man was set free from bondage, um, the, the way that this unfolded frightened the people over there on the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee badly, and they asked Jesus to leave. So Jesus and his disciples, they got back in the boat and they decided that they were going to cross back over to the Jewish side of the sea. And when they arrived on the other side, the word spread throughout the area that Jesus had landed there and a great number of people gathered to see him. And one of the men that came to see the Lord, I guess you could call him a modern day equivalent of a pastor. He was a leader in one of the synagogues on, uh, in, in that area. And this particular man had a 12-year-old daughter who was sick and was on the cusp of dying. The man who came, his name was Jarius. And he was absolutely desperate to see a miracle take place. And in the text of my message today, we are not only going to see that Jesus Christ is Lord over the spirit world, we're going to see that Jesus Christ is also Lord over both disease and over life and death. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, to Mark 5. And our text this morning is Mark 5, 21 to 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. So at the beginning of the story that we see unfolding, we see a desperate man seeking audience with Jesus. This man named Jairus was about to lose his daughter to some sort of terrible disease, some calamity that had befallen her. And it's apparent from the dialogue that this father loved his little girl dearly and he would go to the ends of the earth to save her. And that being said, everything that he had tried to do to save her thus far had failed to help. Oftentimes when people are going through, through life and, and everything is rosy, there's this kind of drift that occurs. And people, when things are nice and good all the time, tend to drift from God. They don't seek an audience with him or assistance from him. That's the natural way of it. But then there comes... Stormy circumstances 
in our lives, and all of us face them to lesser or greater degrees. And these difficult, trying circumstances raise our awareness of really how small and vulnerable to calamity we really are. Circumstance like this does one of two things. It either hardens a person in anger and frustration over what they cannot control, or it actually winds up bringing a person to their knees where they cry out to God for help. And I've seen both, and you probably have too. And in this case, there was a man here desperate to save his little girl from certain death, and the scriptures don't tell us exactly what was wrong with Jairus' daughter, only that she was very sick. And Jairus, we see from what we read here, was a God-fearing man, and he believed that God was using Jesus to perform miracles. We're told that he was a leader in the synagogue, and while other members of the synagogue were against Jesus because his teachings threatened their status quo, Jairus was open. And he was convinced that nobody could be doing the things that Jesus was reported to be doing unless God were with him. He had been told about, and maybe he had even seen firsthand, what Jesus had done for other people who were miraculously healed, and this could be why he was here. No doubt Jairus in that region was aware of the outcome of Of what took place, we see in Mark chapter 2 with the paralytic, remember? His friends lowered him through the roof in the house so that he could be healed by Jesus, he could be touched by Jesus. No doubt he had heard what had happened. And no doubt the story of this man was spread throughout the region and that's why the crowds were pressing in on the Lord. And when Jairus came to Jesus, he humbled himself. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged that he would come over to his house and place his hands on his little girl so that she would live. You can just see that the, the heartbreak of this man as he knew that his daughter's life was in the balance. And Jesus, being filled with compassion, he saw this man's sincerity and he saw this man's faith and he agreed to company, accompany Jairus to his house. When when we look at this story, it it really exemplifies the true nature of faith. And when we have issues that need addressing, prayers that we are asking God to answer, it's important for us to understand and recognize that there is power resident in Jesus to meet every need, to meet all needs. Secondly, when we we have needs, we should not hesitate to seek audience with the Lord. And Psalm 103.8 tells us that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Now, Jairus was surrounded in his everyday life by skeptics. And I'm sure... Maybe if the other synagogue leaders found out what he was doing and coming to Jesus, they would have maybe been disapproving. But Jairus didn't let what other people said about the Lord Jesus keep him him from seeking assistance from him. In another place in Scripture, Jesus said, In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jairus humbled himself before the Lord, falling at his feet. He laid his request before Jesus with this reverent earnestness. And you know, my friends, we're called to do the same today. 
God's told us in his word in Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. God calls us to place complete confidence in him. To place complete confidence in his power and as we sang this morning, his goodness. The goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Jairus did in this story. Jesus heard his cry for mercy and he decided to grant his request. While en route to where Jairus lived, the scriptures tell us that these crowds of people, I guess they had heard about everything that Jesus was doing and saying, and they pressed in all around him. And as they, as they traveled towards Jairus' house, these people were rubbing up against Jesus because there's just such a great conglomeration of them. They were just wanting to be around where Jesus was. And among them was this woman in great need who had been suffering from chronic bleeding for 12 years. And we continue to read from our text in verse 25. And the woman, and a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you asked, who touched me? But Jesus looked around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So here we have the circumstance of yet another person. Another person who had desperate need approaching the Lord Jesus. And in her suffering, this unknown woman had apparently tried everything to be relieved from her calamity. And if you understand the Old Testament and the law of Moses, you would understand the horrible circumstance that this woman was living in. And, and, and the, the issue is that she was unclean. See, in Leviticus chapter 15, 26, it's written in the law of Moses. When a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge, just as in the days of her period. And what that meant is that anyone who had contact with this woman while she was in this state was deemed unclean. So people didn't want to be around her. They didn't want to spend time with her. This woman was socially isolated. She was desperate. We don't know the circumstances of her life and her family and everything, but if they were devout Jews, she would have been in this perpetual state of uncleanness. And, and she would have been feeling it. And it According to what we read here, she actually spent everything that she had to try and get help. She, she bankrupted herself to try and get help from the physicians, but instead, in get, instead of it getting better, it was worse. Now, remember the story of Paul and Barnabas when they went into uh, their mission? The Lord confirmed a lot of what was being said by signs and wonders. Acts chapter 14, 3, verse 3 says this. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there. They were in this place called Iconium. 
speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. Now, a lot of people question the purpose of the miracle of physical healing. I want to talk a little bit about this. The miracle of physical healing is a visible manifestation that the kingdom of God is taking ground from the kingdom of Satan. It's a physical manifestation of that. You see, because sickness uh, came and death came because of the fall. Right? So when, when God decides to heal someone physically, supernaturally, it is a sign that he is taking ground away from, from, from the enemy. And the very act of a miracle like this is a herald of God's coming final triumph. And it's meant to show us that, that the Lord is in control of absolutely every aspect of life. And when we ask for healing, we pray as Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, 10, saying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, there is a theology out there that says there is absolutely no refusal on God's part to not to heal someone physically when they pray for it in faith. And I, I don't believe, my friends, that that is a scriptural teaching. I believe, yes, that there is physical healing that God performs, but he never performs physical healing without a reason behind it. And sometimes God in his sovereignty decides not to heal someone. He does not say yes to every prayer for healing. God answers every prayer that we have. When we, when we pray and we ask God to intervene in our circumstances, he will answer every single time. Sometimes he grants the request and he says, yes, it's my will for that to happen. Other times he says, no, that's not my will for that to happen right now. I have a different plan. Or wait, it's not the right timing for my plan. So God always answers prayer. So what I'm saying here is not that God does not answer prayer, but that God does not always say yes to what we want. God distributes the gift of physical healing just as he does with other supernatural gifts that are bestowed. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 tells us, How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? The salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed and here is the caveat, distributed according to his will. So if it's God's will to heal us here and now, he has a reason in the spectrum of the eternal picture for that. If it is not God's will to heal us here and now, we can trust that healing will not achieve the best common good or the best declaration of his kingdom, and therefore it is best for us not to receive that. I know people who say, well, how can any sickness bring glory to God? I want you to ask yourself this question. The life and impact of someone like Joni Erickson Or there's a guy named Nick Wojcik who live with physical, who've lived with physical calamity. Would their ministry and their reach into the world be as effective if they had not had their calamity? 
Now, I'm not saying that everybody's a Joni Erickson or a Nick Wojciak. But I'm telling you this, that God allows our brokenness and our physical suffering sometimes to achieve something else that we can't see right before us. We might think that I should go here. I should do this. I should have this ability. I should, have, I should be able to do this. And that's going to be what's best. But God says, no, I understand more behind the scenes than you could ever understand. I have my finger on the pulse of what is best in this universe. And I, need, I want you to trust me, my child. Ask but understand that if it is not in accordance with my will, I will say no. Now, I guess this is a, a bit of a rabbit trail from where we're going because in the particular case that we're going to talk about here, this woman came to Jesus as he was traveling to Jairus' place and the woman touched him. And, and, and she received healing. Now, God uses healing to accomplish his purposes, divine healing. He also uses illnesses and afflictions in amazingly beautiful and sanctifying ways to build our faith, cultivate our humility, and experience his strong, sufficient grace as we walk through our lives. Now, when all hope of recovery was gone, this woman heard about Jesus and everything that was being done through him. She thought to herself, if only I could get close enough to him and touch the hem of his robe, touch his robe, then I could be healed. And she thought about this and she carried out her plan. And when she reached out and she touched Jesus' robe, power, it says, immediately went out from him and she was completely healed. The woman had planned on quietly moving on, but Jesus knew that something, someone had reached out in faith because divine power had gone out from him. And in recognition of this, Jesus verbalized it, verbalized it and he asks, who touched me? <laughs> this is a perplexing question that the disciples surrounded him Scratched their head at. Like, what do you mean who touched you? There's people pressing in on you from all sides. But it was impossible to touch Jesus in faith without him knowing it and without his healing. And in this case, we shouldn't be superstitious thinking that there was some special power in the cloth of Jesus' robe. As well, we shouldn't fall into the error of, of believing that it was because of ignorance that Jesus asked this question. There's no power in the cloth. There's no power in the shroud of Turin. There's no, it, there, it, it, that's not the point of it. And, and Jesus was not ignorant of this question that he asked. He was fully aware of of who had reached out to him, and he recognized this woman's faith. And it was his will to heal her. The reason for the question was resident in the fact that Jesus desired to give this woman a greater blessing than mere healing. He also wanted her to understand God knew of her suffering and prayers to be healed. And although she'd been rejected by her society because of her condition, she was loved by him. And God heard her cry and desired to show his compassion towards her publicly. This was done to demonstrate the nature of God's love and compassion to everyone who witnessed the miracle as well. God isn't unaware, my friends, of the cry of the human heart. He's compassionate. He sees our cry. He sees the deepest brokenness that we experience. It's good for us to ask of the Lord and to, and to bring ourselves into his presence. This story exemplifies the heart of God for those 
who desperately seek him. Jesus understands the brokenness of our circumstance in its present state, right? He assures us through this miracle that he's not unaware of suffering. He determined that the healing would be a sign both to her and the people that witnessed it that he, in fact, as our creator, is Lord over our physical health. He's Lord over the spiritual realm, as we saw with the man that was tormented in the garrisons. And he's Lord over our physical health as we see it here in this passage. But here we are. You see, after Jesus healed this woman, he went out of his way and took time out to address the circumstance with this woman. And then in the meantime, we read that an entourage of people came from Jairus' house with some very troubling news. And the troubling news was this. In verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? You can imagine the father of the sick little girl and how he was feeling at that moment. You see, Jairus and the woman who had touched Jesus had much in common. Jairus had approached Jesus publicly, and the woman had approached Jesus secretly. But both expressed their faith in him, and both were assured by Jesus. The woman was assured that her faith had made her whole. And here Jairus, he'd gone through great lengths to see Jesus, but he had sought him out too late. The news brought to him, I mean, I can't imagine if that was me as a father of a little girl and I had gone all through this to get to the master and then before the master can get back to where I lived, my daughter died. Can you imagine how horrible he would have felt? How distressing and and devastating it would have been? There had been questions circulating in his mind. Oh, if only Jesus would have continued and not spent time to deal with this woman. I mean, there's all kinds of questions that he'd have in his mind. The messenger suggested that now she had died, it would be, there'd be no point into having the healer come to the house because you can't heal a dead person. When their heart is stopped, the heart is stopped, they're dead. You can't heal someone who's dead because they're dead. But God had permitted this little girl to pass away And he had a different plan. His plan was to show these people something that they needed to know about him. And one of the things that this this shows us as we read this is that death is not the end. Death in the physical body is not the end. There is someone who has created the heavens and the earth and who has established all things in their foundations who has a say on the outcomes of what happens. You see, for even though the physical body is weak and subject to sickness, decay, and death, Jesus not only holds the keys to the spiritual realm, to the physical health that we have in the physical realm, but he also holds the keys to life and death in the eternal realm. And we continue to read in verse 36. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why is all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went into where the child was. 
The people who are present at Jairus' house knew the peril that his daughter was in. She'd been struggling and, they'd, and she'd been fighting for life. And we don't know how long she was sick, whether it was something that just came on her suddenly or whether she struggled her whole life and this was kind of the end of her struggle. But she, when she stopped breathing and she died, the people who were watching over her, they knew that she was dead. She died. She wasn't breathing. She wasn't moving. And this is why they were all wailing and crying to mourn her loss. But Jesus told them, he said, she's only sleeping. Isn't that an interesting way of putting that? You know, when you look at that statement, she is only sleeping, it tells us something about death. People think in, their, in this society that we're in right now that live it up, huh? you know, get what you can out of this life because after this is done, you're six feet under, that's it, that's, there is no more. Well, Jesus Christ tells us right here that our physical life in this body is not, is not just, is not it, okay? There's more to it than just what we can feel, see, smell, taste, all the five senses, the physical realm. This is just a piece of the puzzle. There is an eternal life that comes after this for those who believe, but there is also eternal separation from God, eternal damnation and death for those who turn away from the living God. And God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's, he, he wants people to see who they are before him and come to him and ask him to restore them. And you see, <laughs> she's only sleeping. Jesus knew the outcome. Before he even went into that place, he knew the outcome because why? Because Jesus Christ is the living word of God. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. The buck stops here with him. He knows absolutely everything before it occurs. He's sovereign and he's all-powerful, and he's in control. She wasn't sleeping as though she would wake up from her condition in the morning. She had died. But Jesus, these people didn't understand who was standing before them. And the power that he had over life and death, they didn't understand it. He was making a statement of his identity here. The Lord didn't mean that his words, she's sleeping, was a denial of the death that occurred. But uh, what he meant was that what happens here is, has everything to do with what I command. If I say she's sleeping, then I will wake her up. She was dead. He has the command over life and over death. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kuam, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At, the time, at this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. <laughs> oh, our humble Messiah. Creator of the whole universe. Yet, you, did you catch how he carried himself here? When Jesus spoke... There was a change, and it was sudden, and it was certain. Air filled the little girl's lungs, and her heart started to beat, and the blood began to circulate. Immediately, not with delay, the little girl stood up and began to walk around. 
This was no illusion. No illusion at all. All who witnessed what occurred, the parents, the disciples, they were astonished. And sometimes people, we get astonished when God does something supernatural because we're so used to operating in the five senses that we have. When something steps out of the parameters of those five senses, we're astonished. But when we consider the heavens, the work of the the fingers of God, the moon and the stars which he has ordained, the plants, the living creatures, the animals, the ecosystem, and how everything is intricately woven together and works together. Everything that we look at that has breath gives praise unto God. Everything. And here is the creator of the heavens and the earth standing in this place looking at these people and saying, no, death does not have the final say. I am, I have the final say. And he who believes on me should not perish but have everlasting life. And I am able to call that which is dead back to life because I am the resurrection and the life. God answered Jairus' prayer. It wouldn't have been easy for him to come to Jesus publicly and ask for help. But there's something in Jesus that he recognized as being good and from God. And indeed, he was right. For the living God, veiled in flesh, born of a virgin, present from eternity past, into his present circumstance. That living God visited him at that moment. And he believed. And his little girl was restored unto him. You see, as believers, this gives us comfort because the same Jesus that raised this little girl from the dead, he made promises to all of us who believe. And those promises are true. And when Jesus speaks, he speaks the truth. He came to testify to the truth. That's what he said to Pilate when he was before his trial. For this reason I came to testify to the truth. The living word of God, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. He gives us this comfort. See, it doesn't matter what happens in this physical realm to us. Whether we get ill and God supernaturally lays his hand upon us and heals us to give us time that he has for us to complete the mission that he has for us while we're here, or whether he says, it's time for your mission to be completed and it's time for you to go to your eternal home and to be gathered to me, or whether he says, you have died and as a testimony to all these people of my resurrection power, I'm going to bring you back just like this little girl, just like Lazarus, so that you can bring, so the circumstance can bring me glory and the people can see that death is no master over the living God. It doesn't matter, you see. The question is this, does my life resonate um, the glory of God? That's what he wants. And that's what he will accomplish. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 23 says this, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn Christ the first fruits, and then when he comes, those who belong to him. And again, it's written in the same chapter in verse 50, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. 
When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And the question is, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Do you see? You and I, when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, He is the master of our destiny, and He's taking us into eternal life. It doesn't matter what physical calamity that you face on the earth here. Yes, you pray, God, if it be your will to heal this body and preserve me so that I can glorify you in this mission, I would love that. But Lord, if you choose to allow me to succumb to my physical injury, to my physical health issue, and you take me home to be with you, (laughs) I am confident that you are Lord over life and death. And what you have promised here, death will be swallowed up in victory. The imperishable will be swallowing up the perishable. The mortal will be swallowed up with immortality. And my friends, this is the hope that we have. It doesn't end here. The Lord has a plan. We don't know when our last day is. I could go home today and this is the last day that I breathe and I go to eternity. But I know where my eternal home is. You too. You don't know if this is your last day. This could be your last minute. We don't know that. But the Lord says that your life continues after this life if you believe in him. And if you don't believe in the Lord, he's calling you to make your life right with him. He's calling you to repent and ask him to be your savior and to allow the sacrifice that he made for your sins to cover your sin and to take, or not to cover, to wash your sin away so that you can be his child, so that you can be part of this eternal life that is in him. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for this time that we have. We thank you for the story of Jairus. And God, he asked you to heal his little girl, and it didn't work exactly how he thought. But God, you did a miracle to show that you are Lord over life and over death. You healed the woman along the way to show that you are life. You are Lord over physical health. Lord, you are, you are Lord over the f- spiritual realm. You are Lord over all. Jesus, you are Lord, and we thank you and we praise you for this day that you have made. Lord, may we glorify you. May everything that we do glorify your name. Help us, Lord, to to live in such a way that pleases you and honors you. As we go our separate ways, God, help the people here to be encouraged that if they're suffering, that you understand and that you have a plan, and your plan is for good. You are good, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.